Welcome to the podcast entitled Health and Wellness Briefs, Tactics for a Better You. I'm Dr. Burton Melnick, Vice President for Health Promotion and Chief Wellness Officer for The Ohio State University. This podcast series is brought to you by my CWO office and wonderful Buckeye Wellness team in order to provide you with evidence-based micro-learning modules to optimize your health and well-being. Our podcasts start by taking a dose of vitamin G. Given that vitamin G or gratitude is one of the simplest research-based strategies to improve mood, sleep, and optimism, as well as reduce stress and blood pressure, Please take a few seconds now to think about who or what you are grateful for today. Give a dose of vitamin G to someone today for even more benefit. Today's topic is building mindfulness and movement into the classroom. Students are stressed and burnt out, and we need to build in wellness practices into their required curriculum. My guest today is Amber Esmond, who is an Associated Assistant Professor Professor of Clinical Practice at the Ohio State University College of Nursing. Amber is nationally certified as a family nurse practitioner and does a fantastic job of building mindfulness and movement into the classroom. Amber, welcome to my podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Bern. Let's start with this first question. Amber, how can mindfulness practices be integrated into daily classroom routines to support student well-being and academic success? That is a great question, Bern. One of the first things that I always like to do in the classroom is kind of get the buy-in, just like get the conversation going about what wellness is and how we can integrate it into our daily activities. And I think it also um, opens up an opportunity for professors to be able to be creative with it. Um, I'm a certified yoga teacher, so um, there are times like if I am teaching a didactic course, I will go ahead and just, you know, start with a small yoga practice. Um, yoga has um, lots of um, benefits as far as like focus and concentration. Um, and then also uh, one of the things that I do for the buy-in is just really since we're assigned, you know, we do have science uh, integrated into our curriculum and nursing. I really uh, talk about how we can activate the parasympathetic nervous system, how we are tapping into our minds to increase our alertness and focus, especially when you're a young college student and you're just kind of rushing for like an early morning class. I think it's really key to also point out the rationale for why we want to treat well being in the classrooms as a necessity, not a nicety. We have so many national studies that show clinical anxiety and or depression affect about 40% of college students throughout the country. 
and two thirds of college students who are no longer enrolled in college are not there due to mental health issues. But faculty must walk the talk because if we don't walk the talk, if we don't integrate this into our curricula, our students are not going to learn and practice these very valuable habits. So Amber, what are some effective strategies for introducing movement breaks or activities into the classroom without disrupting the flow of learning? That's an excellent question, Bern. I think it is if you're writing your teaching plan, integrating it as part of the teaching plan, making sure that uh, students are aware. Um, I always love the courses where um, they uh, have what we're going to do for the day, right? Our like nice little checklist. So mm -hmm. I always have like some movement brings integrated into there. I also find that after about 50 minutes, students are no longer paying attention. So it's really good to give a break and then come back with a movement. So, um, and that can even be with like a breathing uh, break. I also really like to integrate our 10 dimensions of wellness. And so making sure that it like doesn't get redundant, that you can do different uh, variances of that each time. That's great. And students sit traditionally for hours each day. We know prolonged sitting increases cardiac risk, but it's also the biggest drain of our energy. It leads to mental clouding. So the fact that you introduce movement breaks and activities into the classroom I have no doubt that'll improve the academic performance. Can you talk a little bit more about what types of movement breaks? Can you give specific examples, Amber, for other faculty who are curious about exactly what do you do and how long do you do it for? Absolutely. And, you know, and it depends on if it's a high stakes testing situation, because with high stakes testing, I have this formula for doing some yoga practice where um, we do some activation of the parasympathetic nervous system by doing some forward folds and then, um, you know, doing deep breaths. And we're doing that three times. And then also for focus, um, we do like a tree stand or a warrior three pose because that helps with focus and alertness. Um, other ways that I've done when I've taught courses like med surge, where we have like the rule of nines for like um, a burn victim, teaching students how to do a Macarena actually is really fun to start to remember like what's four and a half, what's four and a half and, and, and just making it fun and creative each and every time. Sometimes it could just be like, let's pause. We've been typing a lot. Let's go ahead and do like some wrist and stretch movements. So it doesn't even have to be like a, a large movement. It's just being mindful of like, hey, we've been sitting here for a while. Let's get up and stretch. Or like when I'm teaching increasing your cranial pressure, and we would need to talk about things that can increase your intrathoracic pressure. Like, so have people stand up and like lift one leg up. And what does it feel like when we have flexion in our body and noticing like um, the d changes in pressure. So it kind of helps you like even be alert um, to like your senses and nursing and why you would want to position a patient in a certain way. So I always like to adapt to that, especially if I'm teaching like medical surgical nursing. <laughs> That's great. Another one of our terrific faculty actually does what's called lecture signs. And she will pull up, even if it's a two minute video, um, and she'll say, and I've done this very successfully, let's all march or let's dance while we watch this particular video, but just move something. 
because again, let's get our blood flow going. Let's get more mentally alert. It works. So Amber, in what ways can educators adapt mindfulness and movement techniques to meet the diverse needs of students, including those with attention deficit or sensory processing challenges? Uh, one of the things that I found is people who do have ADHD, like will welcome like the movement. Um, and then, um, so, you know, cause it does increase alertness and it decreases fatigue. Um, I've also done these movements like prior to a clinical practice setting. And so oftentimes, you know, students like kind of rush out of the door. And so that just helps like um, bring like their focus and attention by specific movements in general. So I do, I have found that students really do actually appreciate like the break because it's hard for them to focus. Um, I have not had any experience specifically with some sensory processing challenges, but I can imagine that like some of the balancing postures and different movements, um, you know, Every time I do any kind of activity with my students, it's always, um, you know, uh, it, it's a volunteer, like you don't have to do it, but this is available to you. And I've actually found that participation is really good, but um, that's just what I've seen in my experience. Um, breath work is really, really helpful with that also, as far as like helping with the focus and alertness. Great. Then what role have you seen mindfulness and movement play in fostering a positive wellness culture in the classroom? The one thing that I can say that I love about The Ohio State University is our culture of wellness. And so you actually see students bringing such a wealth of activities that they do. Um, so I always really like um, the sense of community that it builds. And especially in the clinical setting, like students are very intimidated by clinical faculty. So I found by doing yoga practice prior to clinical activities, which I know isn't exactly the classroom, it's just like a modified kind of classroom, right? Um, I have just found that it's a sense of community. They also um, feel like they're doing something with the professor themselves, and then they're not they're not afraid to come ask me questions. And I think that that was amazing. And the other thing is, is that I think that they can tell that the faculty care about them also. So we want you to care about yourself and your wellness, and we also want you to know that we, as a college and as professors, care about your wellness as well. So I've actually found like that sense of community just being like really, um, you know, like a beautiful like outcome that comes from that. That's awesome. I always have said there's no sin to having fun at work, and there's no sin to having fun in the classroom as well. A lot of my national studies also consistently show if people and students perceive that they function in a wellness culture that supports their personal well-being, they have less stress, anxiety, and depression. So there's this big growing body of evidence that supports all the great outcomes of doing this in the classroom. Final question, Amber, how can faculty collaborate with students and colleagues to create a supportive well culture and environment for incorporating mindfulness and movement practices to required curriculum? Um, I think it's just gonna, like, we're gonna have to be activists for that, continued with like talking about it, making sure it's at the forefront of, um, you know, education, integrating it into curriculum, making it a standard of practice, especially since, um, you know, nurses in general, we have a very high stress, you know, work environment. So we are always going to be combating like, cortisol levels and there's lots of movements um, that can help with that. And then the other thing that I found is like, even when I was teaching yoga, like sometimes students are like really big into Tai Chi and so they'll leave the Tai Chi practice. 
So it's like coordinating it and also making it so that they're doing some of our movement practices too. So that way it could be like an active learning strategy in addition to that. And I always like circle back to our 10 dimensions of wellness and I add that actually as assignments. Um, so that way it can like, you know, introduce some elements of wellness. We just also edited a book on the 10 dimensions of wellness for college students that's available for faculty. So please disseminate that to your students. Amber, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for listening to Health and Wellness Briefs. Tune in to my other podcasts in this series to learn more evidence-based tips for a healthier, happier, and better you.